speed ahead with no delay. Phase 2 of the expanded polystyrene or styrofoam ban took effect two weeks ago on January 1. But just like the ban on single-use plastics, people weren't ready. For some, it was the spark of opportunity, while for others, it meant time to make a total shift. Welcome to the exchange. Happy New Year. This month, we're discussing the ban on styrofoam. Was Jamaica ready? How have businesses been coping? The discussion segment, right after these messages. Hello and welcome to The Exchange, a financial gleaner and JNN Business Forum. I'm Javon Keyes. The government has moved for the ban on single-use plastics and styrofoam, leaving businesses running for alternatives. The environmentalists say the ban was a good move, but for the private sector, it came a little too early. However, it's here in full swing. But was it the right time? Was it the step for Jamaica? To answer these questions and more, our panelists... Anthony McKenzie, Director of Environmental Management and Conservation at the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA. CEO of Miracle Corp, Richard Lee. And Audley Gordon, he is the Executive Director at the National Solid Waste Management Agency, NSWMA. Now let's get the conversation started on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Jamaica Gleaner and at Jamaica News Network. Use the hashtags The Exchange and FGJNN. You can also tune in on OneSpotMedia.com. Now we're going to get the discussion started in a bit. But first, here's a look at the overall ban on both plastic and styrofoam. January 1, 2020 saw the implementation of Phase 2 of the ban on expanded polystyrene or styrofoam products. It means that neither the local manufacturing nor importation of styrofoam packaging material is allowed in Jamaica. It all started on December 24, 2018, when the Natural Resources Conservation Authority Plastic Packaging Materials Prohibition Order was gazetted. It outlined that as of January 1, 2019, the importation of styrofoam packaging material will be outlawed. This, in addition to the overall ban on single-use plastic bags of a certain dimension and straws. But despite Despite what some would describe as ample time to prepare, there were still calls for a delay. You won't find an ideal time for it, and it's badly needed, but um, understanding that it will have a dire consequence on probably 10,000, 15,000 small food operators that will be directly affected by it. So for those reasons, we are asking for an extension of this um, time. By the end of 2020, for sure. Uh, but we actually just think it should be phased in because of the state of readiness right now is not where we think it needs to be. But the government didn't budge. There was several meetings and consultations with um, private sector based on the, the manufacturers and of course the Small Business Association and the Manufacturers Exporters Association that pleaded a case for an extension based on the cost to them in terms of having to stop production in January. We looked at it, but the government has decided that the ban will go ahead. And of course, we will continue discussions as the ban is in effect January, and we will make sure that the transition is as smooth as possible as we deal with the plastic bags. Some businesses saw the new regulations as an opportunity to improve their offerings, while others, like the Wisinko Group, opted to close that arm of their business, resulting in more than 100 job cuts. We have since suspended all production and are in the process of finalizing um, either relocating a, a number of employees, but I think the vast majority of the employees are going to be taking redundancy. Despite these mixed reactions, the government is hoping the ban will go a far way in making Jamaica's environment cleaner. All right, gentlemen, so let's start the discussion off by looking at the ban itself. I'm going to start with Mr. McKenzie. Right, yes, yes. And we're looking at not just this phase, looking mm -hmm. at styrofoam, but also plastics. How right. difficult has it been to implement these bans? Well, I think the, in terms of the acceptance, we, we saw and we're seeing where it's been significantly accepted by the general population. And we're talking about the figures like about 90%. Um, that's what we're working with now. I should say that we're doing 
an empirical assessment to look at the effectiveness overall in terms of the acceptance towards general population and also the impact on the waste stream. But for right now, we are seeing based on our assessment that perhaps about 90% of our population or stakeholders have accepted and have transitioned into using the alternatives to both the plastic bags that were banned in the 1st of January last year and also the styrofoam. We're not there yet in terms of the styrofoam, but we're getting there. And we're happy with the acceptance so far, I should say that. Are you seeing where people have transitioned a little quicker compared to when the plastic ban was put in place? Um, I, would, I would say yes in one aspect. The reality is that the, in terms of this styrofoam, styrofoam packaging, the, as you know, the importation was banned from last year, January 1. So at that time, we used to import styrofoam, both in terms of the food packages and also like the cups and the meatballs and so on. Those were actually imported. So, so during the last year, the transition out of using those cups and bowls and so the coffee cups and so on, were tra we transitioned into the paper. So people had gotten used to, uh, had gotten used to using those. Um, and then, of course, there is really one local manufacturer of the styrofoam product. Mm, the and so the, from our compliance and monitoring, because that single source has stopped, um, we, we expect to see a quick take up of alternatives. And, mm -hmm. those, and with those alternatives, uh, Mr. Lee, your company would come in. So I want to find out from you, why was it important, or do you think it was important for us to push through with this ban? We had the backlash from the, some members of the private sector saying, we need more time, but was it, why was it important, or was it important to push through still? Well, I think the global movement with most countries banning foam and single-use plastic bags has been gaining momentum. A lot of the Caribbean countries have already implemented Barbados, I believe, uh, Antigua, mm -hmm. and many other countries are following suit. So you saw it get left behind where Jamaica, people are saying, well, what are we doing? Other countries are moving ahead. So Jamaica should do the same to protect our environment. So I believe you do have to have a cutoff point where you say, listen, enough is enough. We've given the notice. You need to prepare for the transition. And I think the communication was very effective in terms of the initial ban, which was January the 1st last year. And then the, the final implementation, which was a few weeks ago, was enough time. We had enough time. We saw the, the ban come in and made preparations. One of the things we noticed was the the users of the product will wait till the very last minute before they have to make the transition because of the cost factor mainly. Some people were very environmentally conscious and made the move prior to the ban or before even the alternatives were, um, had to, they had to use them because they believed in, in the whole um, objective. So I believe that they had to implement the ban and say, listen, now is the time no more extension. I, I do believe that the, the one factor in this is the investment that the local manufacturer had made. I don't know the impact I, I, personally. I, we we want to briefly talk on that a little later. Sure. But for you, for yes. your business particularly, before the idea of banning, star, banning styrofoam came yes. about, what was your business? Before, well, because you now import the alternatives. Well, we were actually a sub-distributor for Wisinko, so we distributed the foam products. We also had alternative products to begin with, the plastics and the paper. So we already had that. So the impact to us as a distributor, quite frankly, is minimal because we did prepare. So you there seeing the spark of opportunity? In Certainly. This, well, in we had no choice maybe. because it's legislation, so we had to comply. So, so let me bring in Mr. Gordon. Was it important for us to push through with this ban irrespective of the backlash? Absolutely important. We have a vision 2030. We want to move our country into first world status. 10 years away. We have very limited time within which to do that. And you know, you hear the argument about when is the right time. If you don't lead on some issues, there will never be 
the right time. We believe that despite the challenges that may be there and the kinks that are to be worked out, that we don't wait for perfection to start a good thing. Mm. Because the adage is that you don't make perfection the enemy of good. Start and work as we go along to perfect. But was it really the right time, though? Do you think it came too soon? Absolutely, Mr. absolutely right. But Mr. Lee, I want to find out from you. I, I think I have to be very balanced in my statement. So I believe the first be ban, okay, I believe was a little too short. Meaning, if I'm correct, the ban was announced for the first phase of the plastic bags in September. August or September of 2018. Mm -hmm. And the, so we had roughly four months. However, the reality is that in establishing relationships with factories in the Far East where you have to have orders well ahead of time and the shipping time can take up to two months approximately. So orders that our company had in place from August and before never really got to Jamaica until uh, in some cases the end of October. So we literally had eight weeks to get rid of the product that we had um, and then embargo it at the end of December as per you know requests. So I believe it was a little short. I don't think it was ridiculously short, okay? But perhaps maybe six months would have been appropriate. And certainly the second phase, there was definitely enough notice for that part of it, in my opinion. So you're saying for this phase, enough time was I granted. I believe so. So what would you say um, is the call that's coming from your colleagues at the PSOJ and from JMEA and the Small Business Association? Is it warranted then? Can you be more specific? So they're saying that they didn't get enough time for this phase of the ban. In one instance, they're calling for hopefully six more months or a year for this phase of the ban particularly. Is that call warranted? Because they're saying the first phase was too short. But this time around, they had much more time comparatively to prepare. So what would you take of their call well, at this point? I try to put myself in the end user's shoes, okay, which is their purchased a bunch of foam, knowing that the ban is coming, and then of course the agencies will have flexibility to allow them time to use the product before they start the enforcement. So perhaps maybe too much was bought, too much hoarding. Um, I personally made sure that we got rid of all of our product prior to this ban, because this ban now we started from, from July of this year to say, listen, we're not going to continue to sell any more local foam and we came out of it completely. So to answer your question, perhaps a little more extension can go, but where do you draw the line? You ultimately at some point have to draw the line. And I do believe that for the second yeah. phase that there was adequate notice. All right, thank you, Mr. Lee. So Mr. McKenzie, um, looking at the ban and looking at that um, perspective there, talk to us about whether or not as it relates to the legislation mm -hmm. and consultation, yeah. is it almost like a, you're wondering what's happening because the consultation took place. I want you to walk us briefly to what the consultation was like right. because these mm -hmm. same persons who are calling for a delay would have been a part of the consultation. Right. Is it that their views were not taken, in, taken into um, consideration here? Mm -hmm. Did they agree mm -hmm. to this ban being instituted at this point? All Talk right. to us so a bit about the consultation. You recall that the discussions actually started back in 2016 mm -hmm. when uh, Senator Sumuda laid that motion in, in Parliament, in the upper house. Discussion started there and Cabinet created a working group. So the working group was comprised of a wide range of stakeholders, including the private sector representation not there from industry, manufacturers, um, suppliers, and of course, government agencies. So we started those discussions late 20 well, 2017, right? But it was announced from that. But the consultation started in the working group, sent out survey instruments. We brought in various sector groups to have that discussion, sensitization, so that we could ultimately prepare a position paper. So that lasted about nine months. And we're talking about 2016, 2017. When that information went to the cabinet, the cabinet said that we should have some further discussions again and two sets of committees were again <laughs> constructed and we had further consultations, further surveys and further input from the various sectors. We actually
targeted specific groups to go out and meet with, had those discussions. So it was over a period of close to well, 18 months sub subsequent to 2016 that we had those, all those consultations. There was so, so it was extensive. The, there's always, I suppose, um, from some sectors, the concern, and of course there's a, so some concern about the time period, right? And when the announcement was actually made, there was a pushback to say that the time frame was short. But at that time, it, we were in discussion for three years. And, three years up to and all parties were integrally involved in this they discussion. They were integrally involved. The, I must say, though, that some would say that they would need more time to reconstruct their business so profile was, and did so that on. come out in the consultation but that came out in the consultation and we had those discussions the government was very clear in terms of um providing opportunities for the companies to engage with uh, financial institutions to support any retooling that might be necessary so those discussions were clear and they took place and, as well and, 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 and well. i'm glad that we brought up the idea of liaising with the financial institutions because we're going to touch on that in a bit ladies and gentlemen this is the exchange a financial gleaner and jane and business forum the conversation will continue on the next side of this break please stay with us Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. This is The Exchange, a financial gleaner and JNN Business Forum. I'm Javon Keyes. If you're just joining us, we're talking about phase two of the ban on plastics and styrofoam. Please join the discussion on social media. Share with us using the hashtag FGJNN and tell us how has the ban been going for you? How are you, fe are you feeling the brinks of this ban? Did it come too soon? Please let us know and share using the hashtags The Exchange and FGJNN. Follow us on Facebook at Glena Jamaica and at Jamaica News Network. You can also watch the program at any time on onespotmedia.com. Before we get back to the discussion, let's take a look at the most read stories in the financial Glena last month. Businessman sings Marenga Blues. KFCI's new locations in St. Elizabeth, St. Anne and Kingston. Mobe couple to develop luxury housing at Ironshore. Low exiting CPJ switching from food to finance. Chuck are raising more than US $50 million for Caribbean expansion. AJAS aiming for year-end IPO. Fly Jamaica files for bankruptcy protection. Spanish town businesses happy with Miller verdict. Businessman, Italian wife murdered in Negril. JSC glitch values proven higher than Jamaica's economy. And of course, pick up your copy of the Financial Gleaner this and every Friday at a store or a Gleaner vendor near you. Or log on to Gleaner online at jamaica-gleaner.com for the latest financial stories. Now, continuing the discussion, we would have been speaking before the break about the one, what one would call teething pains of the mm -hmm. implementation of the ban and the idea of whether or not it came too soon. And you brought up the concern about whether or not entities would have received financial back it even that was of some of the concerns rather that came up from the private sector but i want to go to you mr lee was the banner financial burden it was in some regards because the cost of the alternatives are definitely significantly more costly okay and as a very specific example two of the more popular sizes in the lunch box container business, which is commonly referred to as the curry boat box. That's the two side, the one with two sides? No, that's a single one. It's in the shape of a rectangle. They call it a oh, coffin. The, the coffin the box. Coffin. The coffin, exactly go, right. <laughs> and the other oh. side is the two, co the other size is the two compartment. Those are the two most popular mm -hmm. sizes. So prior to the implementation, the cost of foam would be an average cost of approximately seven up to maybe as high as nine dollars for the curry boat box mm -hmm. okay plus tax the alternative presently on the market for that exact size is at an average competitive price is twenty dollars plus tax so you're talking about approximately thirteen dollars more 
and that's significant. Which, which is significant. Because when you think about the past through to the consumers, yes, then you'd realize that it does become a financial burden in that regard. Would right. you say, M Mr. Gordon, I see you smiling. Would you, would you say to more or lesser extent that it was a financial burden from the perspective of, of you being a consumer? Yeah. From me being a consumer is one thing, but as an environmentalist is another thing. And I believe that the cost to the environment for th those kind of material is what we ought to focus on. We may be saving a few dollars up front to buy curry goat, but we will bequeath to our children a damaged environment if they have anything to live on. So that is where I want the argument to be, quite frankly. Some things just cannot be measured in just the little early savings up front to have to look mm -hmm. totally right across at the costs to the bigger picture, the environment that all of us have to utilize to exist. Right. right. Now, yeah, I, I suppose that, and I should, I should point out that mm -hmm. in the discussions and assessments before coming up with the band, we actually, NEPA actually did an assessment, looked at a, one of, I wouldn't call a name, but a popular, one of the popular food chains local food chain that transitioned in terms of their packaging um, to, the, to alternative to cardboard and paper and so on. We looked at it in, in terms of the cost for a meal. It was 7% of the total cost for the meal was relating to packaging. And they had transitioned from their plastic-based um, products. And, so, and they saw 20% increase on the, seven, on the 7%. So it was on the total it was on the total um, cost for the meal, which was a 20% increase on the 7%. So that was what we were finding at that time. And that was just, just one, one, one And case. in some cases, it may be a much larger yeah, percentage I, uh, because... Uh, <coughs> go ahead. Finish. Yeah, but the, 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 the view also, based on our assessment, was that um, once we have more distributors coming on the market, more importers, and looking at various... Um, products and suppliers that over t a short period of time that the prices will get down. Are right? you, s are you mm. seeing that though for the plastics ban? Because I don't see the alternative prices going down. No, we have, we have noticed some, as I indicated that we're doing the assessment now, right, that we could come up with a true picture, but we have started to see some, some decreases. I mean, they, it might be also that the actual um, food um, outlets might not want to pass on that um, cost, to the cost, consumer. cost to the consumer. But um, we are, we're seeing some of that. But I think by the end of this month, when we're finished with that um, assessment, I'll be in a better position to say. But I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's kind of still early in terms of the styrofoam, but we'll still have some information on that. So they were still looking at the alternatives and as a, someone who is importing these alternatives, right. how difficult has it been for you to bring these products into Jamaica? Yeah. Sourcing and bringing them has not been difficult. The, the irony, however, is that on certain plastic containers, okay, one of them referred to as a clamshell, that's typically used for salads, for example. So before you answer yes. the question I asked, because we, we're seeing okay. also, I want you to give us an idea of some of these alternatives. So you spoke about the coffer box earlier and the, right. the, the two side boxes, but sure. what are some of the other kind of alternatives we can see on the market? And then tell us a little bit about the difficulty sure. or the lack thereof of okay, bringing well, these in. Primarily the two alternatives right now is what we call a bagasse lunchbox. Bagasse is typically made of sugarcane trash. And the other one is called a paperboard, which is typically a brown, flat. It, it's what we used to use many, many years ago and lined it with the grease paper. Mm -hmm. So that's called a paperboard, mm -hmm. okay? Similar to what Island Grill uses. That's not a plug for them, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so those are the two alternatives at the moment. The, f the paperboard is significantly more expensive than the bagasse, okay? Uh, so those are the two alternatives. For foam soup containers, it's essentially paper with mm -hmm. food grade wax lining. So those are the, your alternatives. Um, I know we were speaking about cost, which is really a significant part, I think, of this discussion for food operators. And the two compartment, for example, that would typically be roughly uh, $9, roughly, for a two compartment. That same alternative in the bagasse containers, because the 
paperboard, you can't really section them, it's difficult. And the gravy leaking out. Exactly, <laughs> is approximately $25. So that's that is, you're seeing that there's that gap. So typically what you can expect for food operators to have to do is to increase the cost of their lunches, I see, by approximately 15 to $20, and then they, they should, should cover the cost of the increase of their packaging. I think where the real problem lies is the replacement for the plastic bags. That is a big problem. And to be just to give a very quick example, the 18 by 22, which is your typical supermarket bag size, scandal bag, that was running average $1.30 Jamaican per bag. It's roughly $1,300 for a thousand. So it's cheap. Mm -hmm. The same exact size in paper is running easily at best $15. Now that is a significant increase and I think that is the challenge where a lot of the food operators are having is that is a bigger part because to have to then um, pay an additional $14 for packaging to take away the food also incorporating the increased cost of the lunch boxes so the, the so you're you talking and possibly and another and the, and the a total of maybe 30 to $35 between the, the bag packaging to take it out and the container so a, lo a lunch so that would typically increase in prices probably 35 to 40 dollars yeah. roughly. Uh, and, and roughly and consumers i'm sure are feeling yeah. it here and, and there in and that is the price expenses. that we have to ultimately pay if we really are committed to to the environment it is mm -hmm. perhaps is a small but price to pay but, but mr lee still with you so you said that it wasn't quite difficult to bring in these alternatives right but from a financial standpoint regarding uh, assistance from banks and that kind of thing do you see and you even if you're not talking for yourself you can talk because i'm sure you hear your colleagues speaking as well yes has it been a case where financial institutions have been willing to give funding or aid these former manufacturers or importers or persons to import these um alternatives do you find where final financial institutions are willing to do this uh my my experience not in that era is that in spite of their willingness, they're still going to put you through their due diligence. You see, so that is typically, I think, a problem for small to medium enterprises is to source financing because they still typically will not provide financing unsecured. I, I'm not the expert on that, quite frankly, mm -hmm. but I do know I have seen in the media where they were reaching out and encouraging people to come to, to secure financing. The, the cost of importing the, the packaging, I can tell you, is a significant increase in the resources required to bring these packages in because it costs a lot more. So whereas our business may have experienced an increase in revenue, uh, our main concern is the viability of the operators because if they're not doing well and their business is not healthy, certainly it will affect the distributors. So one of the things I believe the government should address is just as how they're committed to the environment, I think they need to address the duty structure on these alternatives. Because yeah. as I'd mentioned earlier, a clamshell container, which is a very popular cost-effective way for packaging, uh, is duty-free at this point in time, which makes no sense because then your alternatives, the bagasse and paperboard, for example, um, they still need the soup containers. They're at, I believe, still at 20% duty. So those, I believe the government should address that to alleviate the cost to the end user and ultimately the, the food operators and then of course the consumers. And, and one would assume that again in the consultations mm -hmm. that would have also come out the need for um, tariffs or reduced mm -hmm. tariffs for importation. Yeah, that, that, that actually came up and I think the, the government is looking at that um, also in the, in the broader context of the discussions, uh, Mr. Gordon referred to the discussion about Vision 2030 and the whole question of the green economy as we transition as a country towards using green products, mm -hmm. how we incentivize towards supporting the, um, the use of green products. So that's a part of the, the wider discussion. I can't speak to exactly when um, issues relating to the duty structure will be amended and so on, but it's part of the discussion right now and I'm sure We'll be hearing more about that. Mr. Gordon, mm -hmm. do you think persons are finding a way around this system? I mean, Jamaicans are ingenious in a, a good way and a bad way sometimes. Do yeah. you find where Jamaicans may be finding their way 
to a small gap that they exist? Th there may be a percentage of people who try to exploit whatever loopholes they can f exploit. I mean, we don't live in a perfect world. But I really hope, though, that looking at the bigger picture, that people understand that what is happening here is to create a better space for them in this world to make Jamaica a, not just a greener country, but a healthier country. And so if we look at it from that perspective, then to try to create loopholes to stay on the bad path, in my view, would be just a bad calculation and, a, and poor judgment. You know what I would love to see? I would love to see this argument about the environment be taken in a fulsome way from the basic school right up, and that people buy into that and understand the importance of preserving the environment the in terms of, uh, and the importance of doing the right thing by the and environment. And I agree with you, and I'm hoping the education campaigns that NEPA has rolling out, mm -hmm. the Plastic Free Jamaica and so on, mm -hmm. will incorporate that. But I'm still with you, Mr. Gordon. When we speak of the alternatives, we, I'm, I hear you with the paper alternatives as well as the baggers. But from personal experience, I'm also seeing where there are hard plastic containers also being offered as alternatives, mm -hmm. which begs the question again, because we're at this point now where we realize that we see the styrofoam ending up in the waste stream. Mm -hmm. become a, it becomes a problem, we mm -hmm. ban it. Plastic bags become a problem, we ban it. Mm -hmm. will it. Do you think it will get to a point where we will have to also start to ban some of these alternatives? Because one of the discussions, again, is also mm -hmm. the issue of waste management. Mm -hmm. So would you say that we have things under wraps? Or is that really the issue, the, ma the ability to really manage mm -hmm. the waste that we're putting through? Because if we can't manage the waste, we can end up back at square one. Right. Okay, so we, we talk about what we see end up in the... Um, in the waterways, the drains, the gullies, and the problems that come from that. And I've, I'd answer your question two ways, because we have to treat with the immediate challenge that we have. How do we ensure that we minimize um, these things going into the waterway? And so we have a program for that, that we will be rolling out in 2020 here, which will see us recruiting from communities that live along the banks of gullies and drains and plant settlements. We recruit people from among them to manage the garbage for us at that level to ensure that you know people move through the communities and actually collect the garbage, move it out to a point where we can get it. So we're going to be creating some employment in that regard. But, but importantly, we will be having the consciousness raised as to, as to how we treat our space where we live, the environment, civic mindedness. We want to get that back into the discussion also because people need to be careful to take care of their space without even being um, in, under any duress to do so. That's one answer. The other answer is, and it's important that we appreciate this, that we will have to seriously look at the fines that we impose on people when they do wrong by the environment. Right, so I want you to hold that thought because I want mm. to come back a bit to talk a bit about those fines mm. when we come back from the break. You're watching The Exchange, a financial gleaner, and at JNN Business Forum, we take a quick break. Please stay with us. Welcome back to The Exchange, a financial gleaner and JNN Business Forum. If you're just joining us, we've been examining the ban on styrofoam. So we're going to get back into the discussion. So before the break, we were speaking about the idea of the fines that are in place for persons who breach some of the legislations with regards to the environment and waste management. So let's go back to Mr. Mm. Gordon, and then I'm going to come to you, Mr. Mm. McKenzie. So Mr. Gordon, these fines, that's been a big issue overall. Mm. Yeah. These fines are crumbs. <laughs> really negligible. Yeah, yeah. So it's like you can put it in your budget to say, let me uh, yeah. break the law and uh. pay this money. What's going to be done about that? Well, I, I, f so you, we are on one here in terms of the fines and the fact that they, are, they provide no deterrent. Uh, nobody f are scared of these fines. And so that in itself is defeating the purpose. Um, I guess if you go too hard, you're accused of being draconian. But I find that when people really 
feel it in their pockets, right, that there's less likelihood that they would want to commit the acts. We have a series of new fines to come and stream, not mine to announce, as above my pay grade, but I know that the cabinet had looked at it at some point in time and uh, uh, expecting that in short order my minister will have some announcement. Short order, five months, two months? I can't give you a time frame on it, but I can tell you I would rather if it was yesterday. Mm. But if we need mm. the fines, if we're going to really have the sort of um, buy-in, the sort of compliance, um, we're going to have to be prepared to, first of all, put the boots on the ground to identify the offenses and to bring people to books and in a meaningful way let it hurt um, where it counts in the pocket. For you, before I come to you again, Mr. McKenzie, one of the challenges I know you face likely is the lack of, uh, well, I don't know if manpower is a challenge, but mm. the issue of machinery, mm -hmm. trucks, and um, compress not compressors, but the, the equipment to really manage the waste. Right. So we do have challenges in that regard. Um, but I still uh, would tell you that were we to have the sort of buy-in from the public, then maybe we would need less trucks. For example, I'll tell you that a good percentage of the solid waste that we collect now is compostable. 60%. 67 So if we were to get people to practice composting, we have a lot of farms around the place, a lot of flower garden, a lot of, you know, we could utilize a good percentage of the garbage that we are chucking right back at source. So that's one argument. The other argument is that we do not containerize our garbage. And so we detain one chuck too long at one spot. There are some places the chuck is detained for even an hour and a half. A chuck which is needed to go to another community is detained one place for an hour and a half because of poor or non-containerization. So there are a number of challenges that goes into this thing. It redounds to a chuck problem. But if we were to behave better overall, we would have less need. And we'd even need less landfill too. Less, less, less uh, acreage for landfill. But the, uh, are, the are we going to touch a bit about the, on the landfill situation okay, a little later? But Mr. McKenzie, you had something to say earlier. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the issue of the alternatives to styrofoam. So what the order was clear as to what the single use ban was relating to in terms of the styrofoam packaging, right? No, the alternative to that would be uh, the paper based, plant based um, products or the hard plastic that was referred to. No, so like for the high density polyethylene, the HDPP, I mean those plastics potentially can be well recyclable. No, um, unlike st um, polystyrene, which I mean there's there's large not the possibility for being for it being recycled to other products and so on. So it ends up as in the waste stream. So we so but I must say that the bands that we're talking about are phased. And in the review if we see where the high density plastics are becoming a problem, then we have to take that into consideration and make some decisions in that regard. You see, because I like how you put it in there. You said potentially recyclable, mm -hmm. but it comes again no back to the idea of, again, are we collecting it? Are we having persons well, separate the waste? Because right, these mm -hmm. containers, as you rightly say, mm -hmm. they are the kind of containers where you'd probably take it home, wash it, and use it. Yeah. But if you're going to the establishment and you're purchasing food every day and you're getting those containers... Well, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's something that we look at because what we want to transition is to biodegradable products. But I, right? I, 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 I want to bring in something that Minister Vaz would have said in Parliament yesterday. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he spoke about the fact that they are currently having conversation with the Bureau of Standards with regards to Standard. standards mm -hmm. for the alternatives. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I want to hear you on it and I'm going to go to Mr. Lee as well. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that have happened before the ban was instituted? No, man, that, that happened, actually. The Bureau of Standards uh, looked at standards. But, I mean, there are always new products <laughs> coming online, so the, the Bureau of Standards always has to go in to look at these new products and the standards that apply. So you might have heard of, like, PLAs, um, polylactic acid products. Um, these are new types of, I mean, they're, put, they're biodegradable but they, they biodegrade over a longer period of time. So what the Bureau of Standards is, doing, is looking at is a, a, a precise definition, for example, in terms of time frame for the biodegradability of the products. Okay. Mr. Lee? Well, 
speaking of the landfill issue and the the non-containerizing of of waste I think is a is a definitely an issue because mm -hmm. scandal bags as we know them have always been used by many households to containerize containerize mm -hmm. waste so finding alternative solutions to that that is affordable I know it is is definitely a challenge um, mm -hmm. you know the government is trying to do the right thing to protect the environment but in the the next breath we're also looking at the practical functionality of these alternatives so you can never really replace a scandal bag per se because it is strong it is relatively cheap and you can also use it after to containerize uh, trash so perhaps we will get to the point where we will have these biodegradable uh, plastic bags mm -hmm. they do have additives etc that will possibly be allowed to come in I believe that there's but a certain bag at this moment that if it is free of two certain additives it is allowed in because if I if I recall the biodegradable bags are also outlawed well the plastics the plastic polyethylene or poly polypropylene that are said to be biodegradable mm -hmm. those are banned based on the, the right the order. One, once they don't have those two they're allowed in once the Bureau of Standards so mm -hmm. uh, perhaps that will be an answer to the problem mm -hmm. that we're seeing here Honestly, mm -hmm. so gonna, uh, you have something to say Mr. Gordon yes but the um, garbage bags are not really banned as of now though and so we make the argument, yes, because it's convenient to make that. Oh, you take away the plastic, the, the um, single use, uh, the scandal bag, so we don't have anything to put the garbage in. But the truth is, garbage bag is not banned. So, <laughs> you know? Right. So, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> However, I to to whereas <laughs> where you go to your, buy your groceries every week, you're going to come back with, you know, 6, 10, 12 of these. You don't need to buy garbage but bags typically. Very and maybe just one to throw them into all of the various uh, bags. So that's very understood. good. And yes, that's the so. problem. We, we, yes, we, we don't want to make that small investment <laughs> into a better environment for our children. Buy a bag. Uh, the garbage bags are not expensive. $30. Buy yes, a man. garbage bag. You're talking scandal about oh, scandal the free is. scandal, the free scandal. Yes. Buy a garbage bag. And 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 hopefully through your education campaigns, the person, they are your so, they really should be it's social marketing yeah, campaigns yeah, that will come to you. Yeah. But Mr. Yes. McKenzie, a concern <laughs> that we're hearing as well from persons regarding these alternatives or some of these alternatives, mm -hmm. they are fearful of possible health risks. Mm -hmm. The heat transfer is one thing and then people are concerned about mm -hmm. some of these alternatives. Are those concerns warranted? based on your research, based on what you would have seen coming from the Bureau of Standards, would you say these concerns are warranted? Well, I think it, people should always be aware, but I know that the Bureau of Standards, they are on top of that. Because that came up as a Even though they still know in discussions about the no, standards. No, but what I'm saying, no, they, they have discussed the standard that was part of the earlier um, process, right, in terms of the standards and the biodegradability and so on. But I mean, Products can arrive at the ports from anywhere, right? And it does only apply to, I mean, we're talking about plastics and singles and so on. But, but so the, the Bureau of Standards will always have to be on top of the situation. And we've had that discussion. Right? So and, so, and so, yes, I mean, people always would need to be aware of what they're using. Mr. So Lee, I, I want to pose that question to you as well. But before I do so, what's the relationship between NEPA and customs right now with regards right, to the so ban are you both working together definitely definitely and the customs they were on board from the start from the start of the discussions and they have ensured that in terms of the importation in fact the, there's an order that speak that is enforced and tracked by the customs agency of jamaica the trade order that looks at the actual importation of these products so they're totally on board and then they've been doing a wonderful job i would say and I think we are in Nepal. can see that. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mr. So Mr. Lee, the health concerns, warranted or not? That always should be a concern. Bureau mm -hmm. of Standards has to do what they need to do to protect mm -hmm. the consumer. Uh, mm -hmm. However, all of these products that we're speaking about have been in the market for the longest while anyway. It's just now that the option now is you have to use them before mm -hmm. it was optional. So people who were environmentalists or concerned to begin with we're actually using some of these products as we've been selling them for over a year and a half 
Okay, so people would say, listen, I don't want a styrofoam container to serve our soup and porridge. We've had customers who will say we want the paper. Even though the foam was available, the paper was well over twice the price, but you had some people who were, in their mind, committed to protecting the environment because and, the and, paper and, and will buy a degree. And we're happy for that, and I'm, sure, and I'm sure Mr. Gordon right. is happy for that. But we have to take another break here on the exchange of Financial Green and Jane and Business for more of the discussion when we return. Welcome back to the exchange of Financial Gleaner and JNN Business Forum. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Javon Keyes. This episode is about to come to a close, but we can't leave without giving our panelists a final word. But before I do that, I have another question, and this one is for Mr. Gordon, particularly on the Riverton landfill. So we've been hearing years on years now that the landfill will be divested and we'll be looking at turning it into a kind of environment where we'll have waste being better managed and we'll have energy and uh, we're hearing multiple things. What is happening with this project? Is it still going to happen? I believe so. I, uh, currently the enterprise team is uh, about wrapping up the first phase of their work in that regard. Um, note that the cabinet has appointed an enterprise team of, uh, a couple of years ago and so that uh, is something that is an active discussion um, in terms of the way forward for waste management in Jamaica. And what the end uh, result will be, I'm not sure yet we have to allow the enterprise team to complete their work. But yes, the um, discussions are ongoing, the work is ongoing, and we look forward to that day when we evolve from just being a landfill, but to turning the trash into cash. And indeed, we want to certainly turn that trash into cash. So your yes. final words, Mr. Gordon, after a fulsome discussion. Yes, I am at a point now in my own life where I really want to urge my brothers and sisters across Jamaica to see themselves as custodians of the environment, to not just wait until a government will dictate something or come to them to suggest something, but look at how we, in our own little way, can be better stewards how we manage our public space, how we manage our home, how we manage our community, how we collaborate at the community level to have a cleaner, safer environment for our children. And there are some simple ways we can do that. We can start by, firstly, making sure that we properly containerize our garbage, that we, we um, have the uh, food leftovers frozen. Don't put it out so that it becomes uh, nourishment for rats and breeding ground for rats, and then we complain about the rats when the rats are all over the place. Don't put home containers out there with water and then when mosquitoes bite us we cry out to government about dengue. Just do little things at home, little things that we can do to be better managers of the environment. It's for our benefit, our children's benefit and overall it's the right thing. Uh, and hopefully in your education campaigns maybe you can look to having instructions maybe even for how to containerize your waste. Absolutely. So and we're going into the schools with a new uh, program this year. Um, uh, we're going right down into the schools and we'll be talking solid ways uh, management to them because ultimately we must take personal responsibility. We're, we're, we we're, 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 looking, we're looking out for that but I'm almost out of time. We are responsible. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. 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 <laughs> almost out of time Mr. Gordon. <laughs> but Mr. Lee, your final words please. Okay, well we'd like to all close on a positive note. So to be very quick with the ban coming in, we had to get the alternatives in quickly. So we had sourced uh, paper straws. When we first started, they started out at $5 a straw. I like to call numbers because people can relate to it, okay? In bringing down the cost, because everyone was very, was shocked at the price, okay? You cannot compare the cost of paper to plastic. It will always be more expensive. So. To cut, to get to the point, we kept sourcing, we kept sourcing, we realized that with the tariffs introduced into the United States for stuff coming from China specifically, the additional tariffs, it was impacting even the major companies exporting to the Caribbean. So we bypassed those suppliers, went direct to the factories, huge outlay because a lot of them only have single items they manufacture. That paper straw, same item, is now down to a dollar thirty. So there's possibility so there for is the cost for these alternatives Absolutely. To go and the yeah. other containers, same thing. We can no longer bring from the United States. We have to bring from typically China, the manufacturing powerhouse, and the costs. There is future 
indications that the prices will come down. So that's so a positive I'm, I'm note. Sure, I'm sure the consumers are looking forward to that price going down. So Mr. McKenzie, you have a final word. Well, I mean, on behalf of NEPA, we'd like to thank our public for the support for the behavioral change that we have seen in response to the ban that has been exposed and the ban that has been impl implemented. It's a positive for the environment, it's a positive for our economy, and we look forward to the future possibilities. And certainly we are looking forward to seeing how the ban and the future of the environmental waste management of Jamaica goes. So ladies and gentlemen, that's where we have to leave things here on the exchange. Thanks to our panelists, Anthony McKenzie, Director of Environmental Management and Conservation at the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, CEO of Miracle Corp, Richard Lee, and Aud Audley Gordon, the Executive Director of the National Solid Waste Management Agency, NSWMA. Audley Gordon. We encourage you to keep the conversation going, of course, using the hashtags The Exchange and FGJNN. Follow us on Facebook at Gleaner Jamaica and at Jamaica News Network. And you can also catch this and all other episodes of The Exchange on OneSpotMedia.com. On behalf of the entire hard-working production team, thanks for watching. I'm Javon Keyes. Pleasant viewing.